Hello, I can't see any of you, so uh, I'll just trust that you're still there after that. All right, let's get started. Um, it is Monday, June 5th, 1967. And just like everybody in here, people were doing their usual routine. Uh, some of them were just getting ready to go to work. Some of them were having their first cup of coffee with some friends. Perhaps a woman is answering the phone call at the office for the first time. Um, kids getting dropped off at school, very normal Monday. And then five minutes later, and for our math speaker earlier, 300 seconds exactly, uh, sirens go off. And these are loud sirens. These are not police sirens. They're not ambulance sirens. They're distinctive sirens. They're actually civil defense sirens. So when these sirens went off on that Monday, every single one of these people knew exactly what that meant. On June 5th, 1967, at 7.45 a.m., the Six-Day War broke out in Israel. And when those sirens started going off, the people began to stop drinking their coffee. They hung up their phone at the office, and the kids in class started to line up right up at the door. The reason is because they knew exactly what they had to do. They had to get to shelter. These shelters that were built in Israel, uh, 15 or so about 16 years earlier, the, a law was passed that said that every residential and commercial venue had to actually have these underground shelters. Now these underground shelters are made to protect during times of war. They're, most of them are underground. They're made out of concrete. They're gray. They're ugly. They're scary. Some of them even are a little bit wet or even smell a little bit. But they're there to protect people. So on that Monday, every single person knew that they had to get to this thing. In northern Israel, there's a small kibbutz, and in that kibbutz, it's very borderline to uh, Lebanon, is a class of students. And they are currently walking in a single file line on their way to shelter with their teachers. They're scared, they're nervous, very much like me at the moment, and they're still standing, going in one single file line. This is not how they expected to actually spend their Monday morning, so they don't know what's going on. They go down the stairs of one of these shelters through a very gray and boring concrete wall, and they eventually make their way into shelter. In that class is a 13-year-old girl, and her and her classmates don't know this yet, but they'll actually end up spending six full days in that shelter. And in that shelter, these are actual photos from 1967. In that shelter, she will sit with her students, or with her classmates, and they will end up spending their six days there without seeing their parents, without seeing some of their siblings, mostly because a lot of the adults were overground at war at the time. They ended up sleeping there, eating there, and spending their full six days, and at the end of that, they were released back to their family. A few weeks later, that same 13-year-old girl ended up walking to her teacher with this very simple request. She asked for a bucket of paint and a few paintbrushes. And her mission was very simple. What she wanted to do was walk up back to that very same shelter where she was at with her classmates and paint and make it a little bit more colorful. What she wanted to do was to try to make this place a little bit more relaxed for the next time her and her classmates would have to be there because she knew that was going to happen sooner or later. So she wanted to create a place where they can feel more relaxed, feel more happy rather than being in a gray and boring place. So over the years, she began to paint the hallway that led up to that room with ladybugs and birds. She ended up painting flowers. She ended up painting storks and other animals all around. And these photos are actually from this year, taken at that very same shelter. And she began to fill it up. And over the next 10 years, she actually will paint about a dozen of these actual shelters all across the kibbutz and nearby kibbutz. And over the next 40 years, other cities in Israel pretty much have done pretty much the same idea, is trying to add some color to these very boring and almost scary looking places. The idea was to help people escape the reality of war when it's going on. That 13-year-old girl, and this is the actual very first mural that she painted in 1967, right after the war. That 13-year-old girl who began that mission on trying to add some color in scary times is actually my mother, and she's actually sitting right over there. <laughs> and I grew up seeing that, and what I haven't realized back then, that she not only just inspired those kids at the time and her classmates, but she eventually inspired me to do the very much same all around the world. In 2012, 
I traveled into Palestine illegally as an Israeli citizen. I ended up spending three days in West Bank painting this five meter mural on the wall that separates the country of Israel and the country of Palestine. Most of you are familiar with the situation there, so you can imagine it wasn't an easy feat. A year after that, in 2013, I traveled into South Africa into the township of Langa, where I ended up spending 10 days teaching art classes and painting murals with a bunch of kids in the township. And a year after that, in 2014, I ended up founding No Limit Street Art Festival, one of the largest and one of the first street art festivals right here in Sweden. We held it in the city of Bruce, and this is actually one of the murals I did at the very beginning of the festival. Three different countries, three different continents, but one common goal, and apparently according to this picture, same outfit, I need a better <laughs> wardrobe. <laughs> <laughs> I just realized that. <laughs> I really need better tank tops. But one common thing between all those things, and that is art. There is this notion that art is not important, that it's something we kind of supposed to have as a hobby, right? But it's kind of strange because if you think about it, every single person in this room, that's the one thing all of us share right now. Every single one of us was a terrible artist when we were kids. Every single one of us had a coloring book on grandma's on Sundays, or we had a little sketchbook at home where we would doodle and draw away, and we all did it. But at some point, we grew out of that. We grew up. But why? Why do we end up getting this notion that it's not important? We all end up drawing, and we get to high school, and you know, teachers in the system end up telling us that we need to put our focus on things like algebra and history, which are important. But why does art go secondhand? You know, in 2013, when Chicago actually had to close over 50 public schools due to budget cuts, the hardest hit was the art program. 10% of the teachers that got laid off were art teachers. And it was the same case in Philadelphia when Philadelphia had to go through their budget cuts. They ended up actually almost eliminating completely the arts, music, and dance program. But things like math and other things like that get pushed on. So the question is, is why is that? As I said, in 2013, sorry, <laughs> in 2013, I traveled into Langa. And the idea of going to Langa was to spend time with this thing called Project Playground, which is actually based out of here in Sweden. And what they've done is they build a venue, a space for kids in Langa to be able to go there and spend some time there to be able to actually stay off the streets. It's to be able to keep kids out of violence, away from getting into trouble, into drugs, and giving them a space where they can actually explore their creativity and feel safe. And doing so by having things like art class, by having dance classes, by having music classes, and so on. And it's actually working. You know, a lot of these kids are coming for extremely terrible situations, and this place is actually given a place where they can be happy, feel joyful. Um, it's very difficult for me, actually, to sit here and try to tell you what these kids are going through. So I'm actually going to take a minute and read this to you. This is an actual letter written by a 15-year-old student from the actual class that I was teaching there during my 10 days. I want to read it word for word because I don't want to lose or miss anything in translation. So I'm going to read it as he wrote it. The pictures you'll see behind me while I read it are photos from his actual home. I obviously blurred out his face to be able to actually respect the family but I want you to give you an understanding of what these kids are going through. I'm a 15-year-old boy. I was born and raised in Langa, Cape Town, in South Africa. We live at home with my big family. There are about 20 family members in my family, and we all share the small living space at home under the same roof. I share a space with drug addicts, alcoholics, and some are even infected with the HIV virus. Water and electricity has become the basic human need in modern-day living. But at home, that's not the case. I didn't know where to turn. And then in 2010, Project Playground opened its doors, and I immediately found a place and space to channel my frustration. The art class in particular offered me a way to express my feelings in a more colorful way. Painting in the art class helped to bring calm into my daily life. And without my art class in my daily life, I would surely have followed the same footsteps that my siblings followed. They would have followed the exact same life I described above about them. Why not? It's actually the expected path most of us take. This is just my story. The Project Playground art class is full of kids just like me. We tell different stories in different ways. But the one thing that brings us all together is our love for art. Now you think about that. You think about the situation that this kid comes from and how something as simple as art 
can change his dynamic and the way he takes life. And yet, as I said, in places like Chicago and Philadelphia, those are the kind of things we tend to brush off and not put focus on. What I learned when I was working with these kids is that it taught them more than just about the basics of art. It taught them how to communicate. It taught them how to work together as a team. And even for some of the kids who actually wanted to participate in taking some leadership roles and assisting, it showed them, gave them courage. It gave them enthusiasm. And that's something that you can't teach in any textbook. Those are the things that art can do for them. When I originally founded No Limit Festival in Bruce, my whole reason for doing that at the very beginning was for, for kids to get inspired because, as I said, my mother was my mentor very at a very young age, and I wanted to be able to leave that for kids as well, to be able to see something that they can actually feel like it shouldn't just be a hobby. Even if their school end up taking that away, they can find a way to see that there's something in art, that you can actually make it. No Limit Festival ended up bringing 12 international artists from all around the world right into the small city of Bros. And what we did is we actually turned that city into an outdoor gallery inside out. And all those murals are still there. You're all welcome to visit when it's not raining, <laughs> which is like never. Um, <laughs> the Swedes know what I'm talking about. But the idea here was that you get to have these kids look at these artists and be able to get inspired by them. I mean, for example, this mural right here was painted by a very talented Polish artist, by a female named Natalia Rack. And when I did my interview in, uh, during the festival, I actually said that if a young girl, a little girl, ends up watching Natalia painting these murals and end up getting inspired and grows up and 20 years down the line, becomes an artist herself and does the exact same thing somewhere else around the world, No Limit has done its job. Because the whole idea is to inspire these kids. These kids were able to see these artists not as just somebody that can actually make a career from it, but they got to see the city not only just applaud them, but praise them. Every single person in the city was so happy and ecstatic to have these people. And that's something that they don't, that's a mixed message they were getting from what they see in school. So now the question is, what can you do? I mean, obviously, as I said, all of us began as artists. Some of us kind of grew out of that. Some of us didn't. But the question is, is what can you actually do? Well, surprisingly, you can do a whole lot because if you see anything from what I've just shown you is that it does make a difference. And after all, this is called differentia. So we are looking for making a difference. So to me, the, the simplest way f at first, and I was trying to think of a way to do this without actually getting you guys in trouble and arrested for being vandals. So we're going to take the simple route. This is a piece of chalk bought at Ikea. Most of you know where that place is, I think. And this is very cheap, and you can buy this. And by using this anywhere on the street, you're not really vandalizing because it washes away, but you can make a big difference. You can draw one heart. You can draw 20 hearts. You can write an inspirational quote, like some of our speakers have gave. And it, you never know what the difference that you might make. A kid might see that and might have a terrible day, and you might just with that little piece, end up changing the rest of their day or maybe even inspire them to go on and do something more. And I think that when we put our focus on these kids and be able to encourage them through art, when you see what these kids have done, especially when you look at places like South Africa and Langa, what Project Playground has been doing, they've been doing it for four years successfully. These kids are off the streets. They're out not getting into drugs. They're not getting into violence. So the proof is there. The question is, is whether we, as people here, are willing to do that as well. I know some of you might think, well, I'm not going to take a piece of chalk. That makes me feel a little bit silly to do that. But think about what we just spoke for the last 15 minutes. Isn't that worth feeling a little bit of silliness for? Isn't it worth to pick up a piece of paper or pick up a piece of chalk, just like when you were a kid and doodle? Back then, you were doing it just to grab a spot next to your sister on the refrigerator. But now... Now you have the potential to take a piece of chalk, draw one little heart, and possibly just change the world. And ladies and gentlemen, that is the difference that art makes. I thank you very much, and I hope you have a good day.